Well, guys, there's um, some not pretty things also brewing in D.C. Hopefully Jack saw the cherry blossoms and not didn't go near the outside of the Supreme Court <laughs> this weekend because it no. seems they are putting up some blockades to prepare for people who might try to storm the building and burn it down. And that is because we have seen kind of a first-of-its-kind news story this week where there has been a majority opinion leaked from the Supreme Court. That's right. So I'm going to give you kind of the background here. There's actually a lot to cover, but it pertains to Roe v. Wade, which if you're not familiar, is the 1973 court decision that basically made abortion legal throughout the country. Up until 1973, states were always able to set their own regulations on abortion, so they could have no regulations on abortion. They could have banned abortions altogether. It was up to the states. But when you got to 1973, the Supreme Court came in, and they ruled on this case known as Roe v. Wade and basically said that you have a right to an abortion, and that became the law of the land. It basically overrode all of the state's laws, whatever they had said independently. And as I'm sure our listeners know, it has been contentious ever since. I would say abortion is one of the most hotly contested issues. It really um, gets to kind of a fever pitch most of the time. And what you may not know is that over the past couple of years, specifically in the past decade, Republicans have been mounting this strategy to overturn it. Now, I want to be really clear. They always could have worked to overturn things through the legislative branch, but that's not really what lawmakers do anymore, it seems. So instead of going about things legislatively, um, they started looking to fight in the courts. And basically, state legislatures um, started taking some action while Congress took none. And they started passing these bills that are known as heartbeat bills, which basically come in and say that you can't have an abortion past like 15 weeks. 20 weeks. They differ somewhere in there from state to state. But essentially, the gist of it is you can't get an abortion once a heartbeat is detected. Um, And that, of course, is much sooner than most women even recognize that they're pregnant. And so this has created a lot of issues. Now, each of those laws that different states have passed have been halted because according to Roe v. Wade, they're currently unconstitutional. You can't limit um, when a woman can get an abortion based on that and another decision from the 1990s known as Casey. Um, And so their goal all along was they passed these bills knowing that they wouldn't be able to take effect. They wanted to get sued over them and they wanted to basically be able to appeal those um, court decisions all the way up to the Supreme Court, essentially so that they could get this case before the Supreme Court, hopefully in front in front of a favorable makeup and get a ruling that would actually overturn Roe v. Wade. And it seems that they have done that recently. The bill that's made it the furthest is Mississippi's. Um, this has been litigated back and forth for about a year or two years now. And the Supreme Court heard arguments on this issue in December. Obviously, um, after President Trump's tenure, we now have three new conservative justices on the court. The makeup is favorable to the right. Um, And it looks like what has been leaked is that they are going to rule in favor of Mississippi and not only say that their law can stand, that they can ban abortions at 15 weeks, they're actually going to take it a step further and overturn Roe altogether. Now, this is really, really shocking information. I do want to point out this is an initial draft that was written in February that was leaked. This is not the final decision. This is not something that was ever supposed to be public whatsoever. But it's surprising because most people thought that uh, they would rule in favor of Mississippi, but that they would rule in favor of Mississippi as far as the 15 weeks go, um, rather than just overturning Roe altogether. Basically, even people on the right kind of thought that they'd you know, chip away at Roe v. Wade versus just like sledgehammer it. <laughs> Um, But this is kind of what happens. They heard the oral arguments in December under longstanding court procedures. Justices kind of hold these preliminary votes on cases shortly after the arguments are made. And then they assign a member of majority to write a draft of the court's opinion. And the draft is often amended in consultation with other justices. In some cases, the justices actually change their votes altogether. Um, And that could still happen with this case, which, by the way, is known as Dobbs v. Jackson Women's Health Organization. So nothing's final here. People can change their votes. The opinion can change. We don't know. Um, But no draft decision in modern history of the court has ever been disclosed publicly while a case is still pending. So it's really an unprecedented revelation um, that's bound to really stir up the culture and, and get people debating it, which I think is why it was leaked. It seems pretty clear that somebody probably on the left that worked in the court did this as a Hail Mary, um, seeing what was coming down the pipeline as trying to stop it. And we do know 
that public pressure has led to justices changing their votes in the past. Um, it's rumored that that happened with Justice Kennedy on the Affordable Care Act uh, back in 2010, I think it was. So that's where we're at. Um, they're now ordering an FBI investigation, it seems, to look into who leaked these documents. So the Supreme Court is not taking this line down. This is, I mean, no matter what you think about the actual elements of this case, I will say it actually is a real, you know, break of democratic norms, as the left likes to say, to go around leaking Supreme Court documents, Jack. I mean, are you totally shocked at this, like, coming out in this manner? Not at all. And I'm ready for the con congressional investigation into the Supreme Court leaker because our democracy is at stake. When democracy is at stake, you need a congressional investigation, correct? <laughs> that's what's You know I've what? Heard. That's that's not going to happen. And uh, the same people who are going to lecture us who think you, you and I, Hannah, I think would agree January 6th was deplorable and a terrible and embarrassing day for our country. And we'll be hearing about that for the next decade. will not say a word or seek to find out who the leaker is. Um, you know, some people will. There's an FBI investigation, as you said, but you know what I mean, the partisan biases involved in this. There's so much to unpack here. While we're on the leaker, I want to read a tweet, I think, that probably summed it up best from our old friend Justin Amash. Mm. And he was absolutely right about this. He said last night in a tweet, leaking a draft opinion of the Supreme Court destroys trust among the justices and undermines justice. The justices must be able to share their thoughts candidly and vulnerably with one another. They are judges deciding cases, not legislators writing laws that need public input. Mm. And I think that sums it up pretty well from a libertarian perspective, from a constitutional perspective, from a perspective of anybody who gives a damn about this country and it being a Republican democracy. Um, you're not going to hear as much about protecting democracy and whatnot from the left as it pertains to p potentially overturning Roe v. Wade, as you would hear about anything coming out of Trump's mouth, what happened on January 6th, whatnot, you know, and that being an, a, a, a threat to democracy. There's so much to unpack here, Hannah. Of course, the leaker's a problem. We're not supposed to know this decision. If this, if this draft becomes the thing that's the announcement in what June or possibly July is my understanding mm -hmm. of when this might be announced. Roe v. Wade has been the law of the land since before I was born. Certainly since before you were born, mm -hmm. and our friend Brad and many, many probably listening to this podcast. I'm pro-life. Um, I, I used to be pro-choice, somebody who supported Roe v. Wade. But even then, as I became sort of politically conscious, I always understood that it was constitutionally on very shaky grounds and how they uh, – ratified this new law of the land in 1973, the Supreme Court at the time. There are pro-life, excuse me, pro-choice justices, those who support, not justices, but legal experts who support abortion rights who will tell you this has always been on very shaky grounds legally. And I think that's, that's where we're at with this Alito majority decision, if it stands. And you're right, public pressure historically with John Roberts on Obamacare and different things has had an effect in the past. But I could have died, you could have died, people older than me could have died, and Roe v. Wade never changed, but it was still the law of the land, and we wouldn't have been surprised. This is a big deal if this mm -hmm. is what happens. I don't care if you're pro-choice, you're pro-life. It is very historic. Um, the left, for many, many years, I mean, four or five decades now, I'm not going to try to do the math here on this podcast, has had it in their head that if Roe v. Wade was ever overturned, it would be the handmaiden's tale, you know, we're under, it's like the Holocaust or Nazi Germany. That's that's what's in their heads. So expect them to go crazy. We saw a little bit of that in some of the clips you might have seen on social media in front of the Supreme Court. And expect, you know, pro-life people to be really excited because they're seeing something they never expected to see. I am worried about our civil discourse. As a pro-lifer, I hope that maybe this saves some unborn lives. After that, I'm worried about our civil discourse. I'm worried about, you know, when I'm, I have probably as many friends on a personal level who are left-leaning as right-leaning, even though I work in right-leaning politics, because I used to be a musician and a lot of those people are left-leaning. I remember just during when Trump was elected, somebody asking me, did you vote for Trump? And I said, no, because I, I voted libertarian. Um, but I got the impression that if I said I did, they might have kicked me out of the bar in which they were bartending at in you see what I'm getting yeah, at? Yeah, no, it's been a real litmus test. I actually, I'm, I hate Trump. I've, I've made no secret of that whatsoever. I hate what he did to the GOP. I think he's no friend of free markets or individual liberty or limited government. And um, 
definitely didn't support him, but I will say I've noticed over the years it has been sort of the make or break in my ability to influence the left and being able to say I'm not a Trump supporter. I didn't I didn't vote for Trump. And they're like, OK, and they'll listen to me. Whereas, you know, if you went down that pathway, it, it is kind of a I think I I've had a lot of people ask, like, have you ever lost friends over politics? Like, I've lost a lot of friends. I'm like, no, I, I can't name one friend I've ever lost over my political views. Um, so I, I do think you're right that that has been kind of a line in civil discourse. And, and I feel like when it comes to abortion, there's a ton of people that break on this on both sides. Like it is not this black and white extremist um, issue that people want to make it in the political sphere. Like most Americans are kind of in the middle. It's sort of like guns, actually, um, where you actually see that most Americans think there should be a little bit more regulation on it, um, but as a whole favor of the right. And so I, I really don't know what this means, it especially it's interesting that this might happen right before the midterms, which right. um, seem to be in the bag for Republicans. But I feel like this is something that might uh, really galvanize the left and turn the tide. And I don't I got to say, I don't know what Republicans are going to fundraise over now because this is their big issue. They make a lot of money on while doing nothing about it. It's kind of like the left always talking about criminal justice reform and police brutality and raising a bunch of money on it. And then they don't do anything legislatively. That's been the right for a long time, at least at the federal level on this. And um, so I'll be curious to see how this goes. But I want to circle back to something you said, which is that um, Roe was was yeah, a decision that was based on really shaky legal ground. And I think this is really important because we've talked on the show about the difference in justices and their ideology, if you will. And I've often said, I'm less concerned if a judge is a left winger or a right winger. I'm more concerned with like, are they a judicial activist? Do they believe in a living constitution? Do they believe they can make up rights within the constitution? Or are they an originalist that actually holds to the founding documents and seeks to impose that rule of law? Or are they people who are like more on the stare decisis side where they just really overly rely on legal precedent. Um, when it comes to Roe v. Wade, we got this decision through judicial activism. There's really no other way to put it. It, it really was um, an issue that they kind of pulled out of thin air. And in the majority opinion that leaked, um, which is currently written by Justice Alito, he said Roe was egregiously wrong from the start. Its reasoning was exceptionally weak and the decision has had damaging consequences. And far from bringing about a national settlement on the abortion issue, Roe and Casey have inflamed debate and deepened division. Now, I can't disagree with all of that, and I'm going to get into my views on abortion in a minute, but first I kind of want to get the full story out there. Um, it's, it's important to notice that in his, uh, in the opinion, if you, if you read through it, he's using really strong language. He often refers to the doctors who carry out uh, abortions as abortionist. Um, he calls it egregiously wrong. And these are really strong terms that I saw Politico point out as well that really indicate the justices don't seem to have the normal like tepidness that they would for overturning legal precedent. Um, they, for those who don't know, they're actually very, very slow to overrule rulings by previous judges. Um, but it doesn't really seem to be the attitude going into this. Um, he also points out that some such supporters of abortion have been motivated by a desire to suppress the size of the African-American population. It is beyond dispute that Roe has had that demographic effect a highly disproportionate percentage of aborted fetuses are black. So he's he's coming in strong. This is not language that's dancing around. I mean, he's really going hard on Roe and this opinion. I find it a little hard to believe he's going to back off of it or that things are going to change too much, um, just given the way that it's written. A lot of liberal justices are kind of taking issue with Alita's assertion in the draft opinion that overturning Ray, or sorry, overturning Roe would not jeopardize other rights the courts have grounded in privacy, like the right to conception, to engage in private consensual sexual activity, and to marry someone of the same sex. And I think that is concerning, but I want to go back a little bit. It's always been concerning, and we've been, we've been pointing this out for a long time. Um, because Roe was built on sinking sand. The court basically ruled that a state law that banned abortions except to save the life of a mother was unconstitutional under the 14th Amendment. The 14th Amendment merely just says that everybody has equal protection under the law. Um, the court determined that Texas, which is where the Roe case stemmed from, had violated Roe's constitutional right to privacy. So essentially, they basically took a bunch of actual rights, like the right to privacy and equal protection of the law, and they kind of mashed up together and made this right to abortion up out of thin air. And they drew on the first, fourth, ninth, and 14th amendments to do so in their opinion at the time. And they said that the Constitution protects an individual's, quote, quote, zones of privacy. 
Um, and they cited cases in which it was ruled that contraception, marriage, and child rearing were activities included in these zones. And the court found that the zone was broad enough to encompass a woman's decision whether or not to determine to terminate her pregnancy. Now, that is hogwash, that there is no right in the Constitution to an abortion. There's, the Constitution does not mention abortion, and neither do any of these amendments that they're citing. And the right to privacy is something I believe strongly in, but to take that and to extend it to things like abortion, uh, marriage, it's very shakel, shaky legal ground. And so if you actually care about things like same-sex marriage, which I do, or uh, abortion, which I do, you need to do it the right way and actually get the wins legislatively where they can't just be um, where somebody can't just come in and overturn them on a whim and and basically a lot of people even people on the left have known that this made Roe very susceptible to what we're about to see I think this summer um, for some time we even had Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg one of the icons of the left huge feminist and a, and a proponent of abortion but she called the legal ruling faulty and she said my criticism of Roe is that it seemed to have stopped the momentum on the side of change and she said she would have preferred that abortion rights be secured more gradually in a process that included state legislatures and the courts um, and so, and she also said that the uh, focus on Roe was a right to privacy rather than women's rights, and that concerned her because she recognized it could really be easily overturned. And so, it kind of feels like one big long, we told you so that this could be coming down the pipeline. And basically, states should have been taking action to go ahead and pass their own abortion laws should this come down the pipeline. And maybe this will spur them now. But the timing of it, you know, we're in uh, early May. Most state legislatures are adjourning for the year right about now. Yeah, that's right. Uh, once again, there's a lot to unpack here. You, knew, you know, you saying even RBG Ruth Bader Ginsburg mentioning when she was still with us that this was on, you know, <laughs> shifting sands of legal, uh, you know, jurisprudence or whatever. Uh, part of me is glad that this was leaked, even though I think it's terrible that anybody would leak, because if this decision does come out to be, you know, an overturning of Roe v. Wade in June or July, people will be more mentally prepared than it just walloping them over the head when it happens. It, but I don't agree with leaking it. You can't do that. I agree with what uh, former Congressman Amash said, that these justices need to be able to trust each other and, and talk about these things and share their opinions in private. If Roe v. Wade is overturned, as I said earlier, the left thinks that, like, you know, abortion, you can't get an abortion anywhere. It's horrible. It's, you know, handmaiden's tale. That's not what you're going to see. You're going to see redder states get redder in abortion restrictions. You're going to see blue states get bluer. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if you saw in a state like Massachusetts or California something approaching infanticide. Um, and that sounds horrible, but if you saw it, I wouldn't be shocked by it at all. They would convince themselves that it's okay. You know, we've been talking about the legal ramifications of this and the politics of it. I'm just going to share a personal antidote. I used to be pro-choice in my 20s and later became pro-life. And it all was due to my anti-war views mm. is what led me in that direction. People always think this is weird when I describe it this way. But as a young anti-war conservative, you know, um, when the U.S. would bomb overseas and you'd hear, you know, 13 children were killed or a wedding party was killed or some, something, and I would discuss with conservative friends, especially during the Iraq war era and the Bush Cheney era, they'd be like, hey, it's a war. We're doing the right thing. We're protecting the homeland and civilian casualties. Stuff happens. Right. Mm -hmm. That's what they would say. Just be dismissive that these kids died and that our government that we pay taxes to are responsible. I'm like, well, that's that's kind of messed up. I thought you were pro-life. Oh, I'm definitely pro-life. We shouldn't have abortion. But like. You know, we're at war with terrorists. I'm like, well, those kids weren't terrorists. Mm -hmm. you, you see where I'm going. I'm not yeah. going to belabor the point. But that was sort of the argument coming from pro-war conservatives. And I had no hesitation to call them pro-war because that's what the hell they were. And as I began to think about the abortion issue, if you're if you're pro-choice and you believe in abortion, it, look, and this is a nuanced subject. I'm not pretending. As a, as a very close friend of ours who I won't name once said to me, it really, really sucks to be pregnant when you don't want to. And it really, really sucks that the only solution to that is to rip a human being in half. So my views on this subject were you have to believe that if you have an abortion, you're not killing a person. It's just weeds, right? It's just weeds. I'm getting rid of some weeds. It's not a person. That's what they have to believe. Well, you know, at some point in that, that might be true. 
But there are points that are legal that I think we're actually killing a human being, and they have to subscribe to what I would call a myth that that is not a person. Those civilian casualties over there were at war. Those aren't real people. That's just a casualty. That's not a person. So that's kind of what led me in that direction. And people are, are afraid to disagree with that. That's okay. But I did want to talk about a, a little bit about my views as it relates to this news story on this subject and how it led me in that direction. But I can't blame anybody who's pro-choice. It's like, you're going to tell women what to do with their bodies. That is a horrible concept. That's terrible. Mm -hmm. But so is the other thing that I just mentioned in a more descriptive way. So across the country, you're going to see people who think, you know, abortion on demand at any time is a, is a basic human right. You hate women if you don't do that. They're going to go crazy. And you're going to see people who think you're actually murdering babies, which I lean more in that direction, also go crazy. And those are both very fair points. And you're going to see most people not acknowledge either of those very fair points um, that are in deep contrast, but once again, to be redundant, are very fair points. Yeah, I love that you bring this up because, and I've, you know, we have one other episode where Brad and I really hashed out our abortion views. If you want to go back and find it, you can. Um, and this one reason I only talk about abortion in these kinds of settings where I have long form ability to hash it out because the thing that nobody wants to acknowledge is that abortion is nuanced. It is not yes. black and white. There are so many things you have to think about. And I feel like it's kind of intellectually lazy to ignore those things. So for me, I'm pro-life. I don't believe in having an abortion. And I have people in my life I know who've had to. And it's a horrible thing. We don't talk Same. enough about how it impacts women, the mental health repercussions on women. I know many people who regret their choices and wish they'd been better informed. Um, that being said, I the idea of the government being able to force you to carry a pregnancy gives me the heebie-jeebies. Like, it is one of the creepiest things I can imagine. And I've always said that when it comes to nuanced issues, probably the government is the last entity you want involved deciding these things. Because while I think there could be some better restrictions around abortion, like I don't think you should be having abortions months into a pregnancy, I would say that, like, there's a fine line between taking things like Plan B, Right a couple of days after you've had unprotected intercourse and being able to remove an egg from your body in that way versus having an abortion a couple of weeks later. And so those are some really nuanced questions that belong in doctor's offices. They're moral questions that every person I think has to be able to determine for themselves. Like I said, I, I fall in the line of not um, being in favor of that. And I think there are so many alternatives out there in society now that like you can choose whether or not to get pregnant. There's a lot of really irresponsible people out there who don't want to accept the consequences of their actions. Um, but the fact is that you can take birth control. You can um, get an IUD. Men can have vasectomies. There's a lot you can do to make sure that you're not getting pregnant. And I will say the one issue I, or area I'm willing to move on this is I want to make contraception so readily available. I wish it was over the counter for birth control, much more readily available. I also firmly believe as a Christian and in churches that we should be stepping up and providing resources to women who are struggling financially to keep their pregnancies. I think that's a really important thing that the government shouldn't be doing, but we should be doing. Um, but when it gets into the government outlawing abortion, you have to ask yourself questions like, what about the 12-year-old girl who gets molested by her father and is pregnant? You know, I think most people would agree there should be an exception for things like that or for the health and safety of the mother or even for rape victims. Many people feel that way. So what are you going to do? You're going to put that child on trial and make them prove before a jury that they were molested by their father? Get out of here. We don't even test rape kits in this country. I mean, come on. So I, I feel like there's some unserious stances in the abortion debate that don't acknowledge some of these realities and how we would actually um, parse this out. And I do think as a whole, when the government bans something, it tends to just create a black market and create a bigger problem as it has with drugs, as it has when it's tried to ban guns. I don't think abortion would really be any different. All that being said, while I am personally pro-life and I guess legally pro-choice versus, or I would just say the government staying out of it and the government staying out of healthcare altogether, I don't want them anywhere near any aspect of healthcare. I will say I can't argue this decision um, because I don't think that it was legally sound. I don't think the, the Supreme Court ever had a right to make this decision. And it should be up to the states. And the states were meant to operate like several many countries. And, and those that had the best policies would attract people. You can vote with your feet. And those that didn't would lose people and would be incentivized to change. And I think that's largely what should happen here. And I really think it's the only way the country can actually coexist with this issue is where people in Texas can ban it and people in California can legalize it. And we'll see uh, which states went out. 
And, and honestly, Jack, I got to say, I don't think it's the I don't think it's the states people think it would be. I think the blue states would win out on this issue because I've met a lot of people who are publicly pro-life until it comes time for them to have to make that decision. And sure. I think the reality is a lot of people want to tell other people what to do, but when they're in that situation, they have a very different tune. So it's a messy issue. This is going to be a crazy Supreme Court decision. I never thought we'd see it in this country. So I guess we'll have to hang around for the next month or two to see what ultimately happens. But this will definitely be eating up the news cycle for some time. No doubt. Let's just talk about you mentioned the midterms earlier. Um, you know, most people agree, even Democrat pollsters agree that it's going to be a slaughter with the Republicans being favored in 2022. This would be the first thing, depending on what public opinion is. And look, uh, part part of this road decision, whatever happens, whatever is announced, uh, if it reflects what's been leaked, you know, the decision to have gay marriage legal across the country was what, in 2014 by the mm -hmm. Supreme Court? I think, if I've got that right. Yep. If you look at most polls today, most Americans, even registered Republicans, agree with gay marriage. They're, mm -hmm. they're in favor of it. They think it's good. And I, as somebody who supports gay marriage and, you know, many LGBT issues, I think that's a wonderful thing. I wrote about it at the time that conservatives complaining about it. <laughs> this is the way the culture's going. Y'all are screwed if this is what you're going to hang your hat on. Abortion is not that. I mean, for, since 1973, the country's always been split to this day. It's never it's never gone to 70, 80, 90 percent. Yes, abortion should be protected. So it's a little bit different culture. As far as the politics in the midterms, this could be something that more Americans than not are horrified that Roe v. Wade might be or, or will be overturned. And that could be the one thing Democrats could hang their hat on that's tangible. They can't they have nothing with inflation. They have nothing with the economy. Afghanistan withdrawal. They're spying on us all and want to censor news. We'll get to that here next with their dis disinformation governance board, which is a very Orwellian sounding thing, but everything is not in their favor for the most part going into the midterm. Like they're, they're screwed. This could be the one thing that if uh, a slight majority of Americans think this is big enough deal that they could hang their hat on and maybe not get as massacred as badly as they thought, or most Americans, which is my general feeling are so fed up with the ruling elites on everything from speech to war, to the economy, to inflation, that whether they're pro-choice or pro-life or whatever, this could be one more thing like quit telling us what to do. You don't rule us and the Republicans could capitalize on this. I don't know the answer on that question as it relates to Roe v. Wade. Now, I would say that's a great point see. because do people vote on abortion? I think people on the right do. They literally show up to vote for getting rid of abortion. I don't know that people on the left have been, if that's been their like motivating factor to go vote. And, and I really do think, like I said earlier, there's better free market solutions. That's why we've already seen a tremendous decrease in abortion over the past couple of decades. It's been on a steady decline without government lifting a finger. Um, there's enough options where I, you know, to me, Roe v. Wade being overturned does not impact me whatsoever because I can choose to not get pregnant until I want to get pregnant and, and I would make those choices, you know? So I, I don't know that it's something that galvanizes people. On the other hand, it's something that um, at least the grass tops on the left very much care about and are up in arms over. So we'll just have to see how it plays 